I'll wake you up right there. Isn't that awesome? The dude that's actually painting that, his name's Eric. He's also like a nationally renowned speaker. He's going to join us at one of our campuses. He's going to speak, open up God's word, and actually paint during the service. It's going to be pretty cool. But if this is your uh, first time joining with us at one of our campuses or online, uh, so glad you're here. You picked a perfect week to come. We're starting a brand new series of talks this week. Uh, my name's Chase Gardner, and uh, I'm a pastor here. I used to teach here years ago. I'm just kidding. I had a great break. And uh, how about a round of applause for that Summer Live series? How amazing was that? Yeah. Dwayne and Dave and Aaron and Clay, live speakers at all of our campuses. Phenomenal teachers there. What a blessing that was. Uh, But we are starting a brand new series. And uh, over the next five weeks, we're going to be going through five full chapters of the book of Daniel, of the book of Daniel. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. It's really hard to find. You can use your table of contents. And as you're turning there, uh, some of you might be saying, why in the world did you choose the book of Daniel? Like, isn't that the one with all the kids stories in it, right? If you grew up in church, you're like, that's why the flannel board was invented for Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and the fiery furnace and Rackshack and Benny, right? Veggie Tales and Daniel and the lion's den. Uh, well, first, man, I, I, I went through this book in my own personal life a year ago, just did a deep dive in it and the truth there, man, there's so much goodness in this book. Uh, but what you're going to see is that this is not a collection of children's stories. It's so much more than that. In fact, I think, and I think you're going to come to seeing that this is one of the most timely and applicable books for Christ followers living in 21st century, secular, hostile America. It is a book that we as Christ followers need now more than ever. As our culture turns uh, more and more against the things of God and the things in his word and the hostility comes up and up and up, this is a book that we desperately need. And you just have to read the very first few verses to see the parallels of what happened back then and what's happening right now. Like I've said a few times before, this is not an old book, it's a timeless book. And it doesn't just tell us what has happened, although it does that. It tells us, shows us what always happens. Read with me in the very first book. We're not going to waste time. We're going to jump in. It says this, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And so 605 BC, a long, long time ago, and the people of Israel are experiencing this unprecedented time of peace and prosperity. They're in the promised land. Uh, They're not at war with anyone. And for some reason, uh, one day, the most powerful nation in the entire world, Babylon, that is very anti-God. This is a brutal civilization. They set their sights on this backwater town of Jerusalem and they besiege it. They take it over. But they actually do more than that. It says this, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought those vessels to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of it. So not only do they take over the city, but they enter into God's holy temple, where his presence is said to reside, and they enter the holy of holies, and they take like the the holy candlesticks or the lampstands, these precious and religious artifacts, national treasures, and they take it back and just toss them on the floor of the temple of their God. So they desecrate and disrespect their place of worship, but it gets even worse. Verse three, it says this, then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel to Babylon as well, both of the royal family and of the nobility, use without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with all knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. They were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them new names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. So the Babylonians don't just invade the town. They don't just desecrate the temple, but they actually kidnap the youths of Jerusalem. So Daniel and his three friends are actually victims of human trafficking. They're about 13 to 15 years old, and they're transported to the city of Babylon where they're to be re-educated, where they were to be taught 
how to be good Babylonians and to turn against the Israelites, how to turn against their God and how to worship the gods of Babylon. So the city's been sieged. The temple's been desecrated. People have been deported. And so for Daniel, every single thing he's ever known changed overnight in the blink of an eye. He went from a godly home with a godly culture and godly morals and godly values. And now he's woken up in a godly place and a godless culture with godless views and godless values. And they have to figure out what in the world do we do now? How do we live faithfully in an environment like this? How can we not just survive, but how do we thrive in a place like Babylon? And hopefully you're seeing how important this book is for us. Because I don't know if it's just you, but when I was growing up, maybe it's because I was born in the South, but like 90, 95% of the people that I knew, although they weren't like sold out Christ followers, they, they at least had a church that they attended occasionally. Or they would agree with the Ten Commandments. Or they had a basically Judeo-Christian worldview. And it just seems like overnight, everything has changed in the blink of an eye. Now, at this moment in America, it is very odd and strange to be a Christ follower. Our culture does not believe in or live according to the Ten Commandments or a biblical worldview. In fact, the truths of the Bible that people used to believe all over the place are now not just seen as outdated or insufficient, but they are hated. And they're seen as dangerous, as something that this world needs to get rid of. And there's this daily and there's mounting pressure to conform to this sort of culture, to leave behind God and his ways and to adapt to and adopt the way of life that our culture is pushing. And we feel the pressure, don't we? Now, it's not nearly as bad or as hostile as Babylon is at this moment, but I feel the pressure, right? You feel that pressure to not say certain things around the, the cooler at the office. There's certain things you can share and certain opinions that you have to keep to yourself. You feel the pressure when you have to have another conversation with your child after their teacher said something kind of crazy, went on an anti-God tirade. You feel that pressure when you're driving through your neighborhood and there's flags or there's signs in everybody's yard except for your own. Yeah, we feel that pressure. And the questions that we are asking are very similar to the questions that Daniel and his friends or Daniel's parents back in Jerusalem are asking themselves. What in the world is God doing? How can God let this sort of evil culture gain power and grow? Why is he not stopping this? What's gonna happen to our kids? Are they gonna keep their faith or are they gonna, they gonna drop it and leave it behind? How in the world are we to be faithful? What does God expect from us in this moment? And if you've ever asked a question like that, this is a book for you. That's what this book is all about. Through the stories of Daniel and his three friends and a few kings that you're gonna meet along the way, this is not a book that's just filled with children's stories. It's meant to give us courage and it's meant to give us hope and it's meant to really give us a game plan of how to not just survive but thrive and a hostile culture like Babylon. You guys excited? I am too. But I don't wanna jump over what we just read. I want you to, to notice what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here. Um, because, you know, I said this in our, our counterculture series, it would be really easy for Daniel to look at King Nebuchadnezzar and say, hey, that's the enemy, Babylon's the enemy. Or Israel to say, hey, Egypt's the enemy. Or for us to say, hey, this group or this political power or, or this, this group of people, they're the enemy. But what the Bible shows us is that we have always had the same enemy and his name Satan. And uh, the thing about Satan is, is he hasn't changed since the moment he showed up in Genesis chapter three. He has the same game plan that he does over and over and over and over again. So first what Neb tries to do is he relocates them. See, Nebuchadnezzar knows that if he can get these young people away from the influence of God believers, then his job of changing them and transforming them is gonna be that much easier. If he can remove them from the influence of their parents or from Jerusalem and surround them with Babylonian culture, then his job is halfway over. His influence is gonna be a whole lot easier. And that's what we see in our day, isn't it? I mean, what are people that are real big on, on TikTok and Instagram called? They're called influencers for a reason. And how many of you have ever known a student who was raised in a God-honoring house, who was maybe super involved in church, they spend one semester away at college, and they come back and they've dropped all that, right? Or how many people know like a couple that has their first kid or two and life gets crazy and they have to prioritize something. So they put church on the back shelf and 
or a month or six months or a year or two years and they're radically different people. That's why it's so important, students, if you're, if you're going to college this year or this is your second year or whatever, the very first thing you need to do is find a local church to plug into or something like crew or, or campus outreach. That's gonna do so much to ground you and remind you of the God that you love. You need like a counter pressure to pull against the pressure that's pulling you away from God. So they're relocated. Secondly, they're re-educated. He puts them uh, through a formal process of reading Babylonian literature and appreciating Babylonian art and learning how to worship the Babylonian gods. And so he does everything he can to instill in them a different worldview with different values and different priorities and, and different morals, different ideas about truth. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's not. I actually encourage you to check out different worldviews. I study different religions all the time. But when you do that, you, you should do it to compare and contrast it with what's in here. You should have your nose in this book as much as you have it in other books or other podcasts. You see, and I'm sure that's not something Neb would allow. Like Daniel couldn't just wrap up his Torah and take it. Like I'm gonna skip this class and just read through Genesis. No, no, no. It was this constant deluge of Babylonian thought and Babylonian values and Babylonian morals. And just day after day after day, that will wear down your faith, won't it? And that's what we see. I mean, you turn on any media. When's the last time you heard the name of Jesus Christ spoken on media nowadays? Unless it's to mock them, right? That's hard to deal with. So they were relocated, they were re-educated, and then it says they were renamed. And this was the whole goal. So they went from the names that were given by their parents to remind them of different characteristics of their God. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them new names after the gods and the goddesses of the Babylonians. And that's the goal. He does all this relocation and all this, this re-education and not just change the way that they viewed the world, but to change the way they viewed themselves. He wants to give them a new identity. You see, If, if you're listening right now, can I, can I tell you something? You know what God's word says? It says that contrary to what our world says, you were created to receive an identity outside yourself from the God that created you. You weren't created to have to form one or fashion one or figure out what it was. You were, you were, you were created to open up your hands and receive the identity of son, daughter, loved, washed, forgiven, holy, spotless, beloved. But see, our culture says, no, that's the last thing you should do. You should never receive your identity from someone else, especially not God. That's something you have to craft. You have to figure out. You have to fashion just perfectly and put it out into the world. So they're, they're relocated, they're re-educated, they're renamed. And I could go on and on, but Daniel and his three friends are experiencing what we're experiencing now just on steroids. So they go through three years of this constant pressure to give in, to change, to drop their old way of life, to become good religious Babylonians. But it's here where God begins to speak to us. It's here where God begins to reveal some truth because he's going to show us in the next verse what he expects of us in situations like this. Because there comes a point for Daniel and his three friends where they stop going along with what their captors wanted them. And they draw a line in the sand and they say, this far, but no further. There comes a point where they look at the king and they say, no, no, we can't do that. Remember in verse five, it says, the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. And it says this in verse eight, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. That's where he drew the line. And it seems like a weird place to draw the line, doesn't it? it? Seems like such a small issue. Like this is not human rights or free, it's like food. <laughs> like you will allow yourself to be relocated and educated and named, but you won't sip on some Merlot or have some nibbles of pork, you know? Why did he draw the line there? Well, first, when it comes to what God has commanded and hasn't commanded, there's no little issues. Every single thing is important. But also what you have to know is that this food that they were being given and this wine, it was definitely sacrificed or offered to pagan idols. And so to eat it, you would basically be worshiping the gods and goddesses of Babylon. But also what the Jewish people ate was very, very important to them. God gave them specific dietary rules and restrictions. Now, most of those have been removed. We see that in the New Testament. If you ever wanna know what part of the Old Testament is still binding and what isn't, 
God tells us in the New Testament. It's really, really clear. But see, it was an overflow of their theology of what it meant to be the people of God. They were God's specific, unique, chosen people. They were different. They talked differently. They dressed differently. And they also ate differently. And so this is something very, very important to Daniel. And so Daniel and his friends look at each other and say, hey, this is something that God has commanded us not to do, and we can't disobey with that. So listen, listen. They could, they could let it slide when it was being done to them, but they drew the line at being an active participant. They said no. They drew the line and they resolved, we can go this far, but no further. And that's a decision that every single one of us needs to make, and we need to make it now. We need to look at every single area of our life. As the heat turns up and the anti-God pressure turns up, we need to look at every single area of our life and say, here is where the line is. You can mock me if you want. You can shame me if you want. You can dump me if you want. You can fire me. You can arrest me. You can kill me. But I've decided between me and God, this is the line and I will go no further. And this is one of those decisions that you need to make before the crisis happens. You need to make it before you are tested. If you're dating someone right now, you need to decide with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, hey, when it comes to, to physical intimacy, when it comes to that, 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 that area of holiness, you need to decide, hey, this far and no further. And God's word is pretty clear. This is going to be kind of weird to hear, but before you get married to that person, they are a brother or sister in Christ. So anything that you wouldn't do with a brother or sister, you don't do until you get married. Kind of weird, I know. But you need to draw the line. You parents, you need to, to talk uh, with your spouse and figure out when it comes to what our children listen to or what they watch or what the experiences they're allowed to have, you need to draw the line before they start saying, hey, but everyone else can listen to this or everyone else watches that or their parents let them have that. Or if you're at work, you need to decide, hey, this is the line before your boss says, well, you know, that's new company policy. You kind of have to do that. I think you're going you're gonna to face being fired if you don't do that. These are decisions that you need to make before the pressure is on. In fact, that's your homework, all right? I never give homework. But when it comes to, to, to your homework this week, I want you to sit down and have conversations with your roommate or just get your journal out and say, hey, when it comes to the area of my finances or what I allow in my ears and my eyes, what I watch, what I listen to, when it comes to physical boundaries, when it comes to all these different areas, here's the line and know it now before the pressure builds. And I do want to say this because I don't think it's, talked about enough. We're entering into a political season. God, help us all. And um, there's going to be nothing but hate and division trying to pull us apart and trying to separate us. And so when it comes to these lines, praise the Lord, like 95% of the areas, the lines are clear because God's told us exactly where they are in his word. But there's still a few gray areas that Christ followers united by the blood of Jesus are free to draw the lines in different places and we shouldn't judge them and it shouldn't allow us to, to be divided. Let's say you're like a nurse at a surgeon's office and the government says that your boss now legally has to provide certain surgical procedures that we know does not line up with God's word and it's not God's desire for his people. Well, one Christ follower might say, I quit right here now. I can't be a part of this. I can't, I gotta, I gotta go. That's a line, and they're free to make that. But someone else might say, hey, maybe I could just talk to my boss and say, hey, you know, I can't, I can't play a part in that, but I feel like I want to stay to be a source of light in the darkness. And that's a valid line, and that should unite us. We should encourage one another. That shouldn't divide us. Or let's say you're a teacher at a school, and the government says that, hey, you now have to teach this sort of curriculum, or you're encouraged to have these conversations with children and not involve the parents, Again, one teacher might say, I'm out of here. I can't play a part in this. And that's a valid place to draw the line. Where another teacher might say, man, maybe I can just move jobs and transition and do something different, but I want to stay. And I want to love these kids. I want to be a force for good. Both of those are valid places to draw the line. And they shouldn't separate us. They shouldn't separate us. Now, I'm not saying that you're free to disagree with the clear truths of God's word. We're not free to do that. There are clear black and whites. You are not free to sit on a board and okay or vote yes to racist or discriminatory business practice. You can't do that. You can't be a nurse that hands a scalpel to a doctor that takes the life of an unborn child. Those are black and white issues, right? We fall under God's word there. But when it comes to the gray areas, 
we can draw those lines in different places and it not be a source of division. But hear me, all of us need to decide where that line is right here and right now because we're all gonna be tested in the coming years and it would be foolish to try to decide then. So this is where Daniel draws the line. <laughs> Y'all gonna hate this, but look at the way in which he drew the line. Look at the character that overflows when he has to stand up and say no to a hostile culture. It says this in verse eight, second half. Therefore, because he's resolved he's not gonna defile himself, he asked or inquired of the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my Lord, the king. I'm afraid of Nebuchadnezzar who assigned your food and your drink for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the use of, uh, uh, are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, a different guy, a little bit further down the line, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over them, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. How did he handle this? In a very un-American way, if I can say that. He's polite. He's respectful. He's honoring. He doesn't cause a scene. He does the opposite of how most of us are tempted to react when we're for forced to draw a line. It says he asked, he inquired of, he didn't demand, he didn't cuss them out, he didn't start a social media campaign making fun of like his boss. He made a simple and polite request for permission and then he just dealt with the answer that he got. No, I can't do that. King will cut my head off. I understand, that's a hard position. Thank you for your time. And he moves a little bit further down the line. And again, it says that he asks or he inquires of this guy. Hey, just test us. Give us some vegetables. He acknowledges their authority over him. He makes requests, not demands. And I could keep going, but to sum it up, he practices what we see all over the Bible. It's called respectful non-participation. Respectful non-participation. This is something I think we've lost in our country. It's so important. I don't know why... A lot of Christians see how other people react and treat us. We see the tactics that people who are opposed to us, we see the tactics that they use. And for some reason, we think that we're free to abandon this whole thing and adopt those same tactics for ourselves. Name calling, mocking, coarse language, belittling, labeling, mischaracterization. You turn on the, the cable news, either side, any side, are you going to see humility are you going to see respect? Are you going to see honor? No, no, no. It's just egotistical, prideful, self-exalting, demeaning, dehumanizing. But that is not the way that we see any godly man or woman behave in the Bible when they stand up to culture. You read the story of Abraham. Genesis 17, when he's standing up to these two or three nations that have kidnapped his brother-in-law, there's respect there. You see how Moses stood up to Pharaoh, how David responded to Saul, who was trying to kill him. You see how Nehemiah, go back and read that book. All these people were lying about him, trying to, to, to infiltrate and, and stop what he was doing, trying to get him killed. You look at the way that Jesus spoke to the very people that were killing him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do to the way the church stood up to Rome in the first century. And now here in Daniel, it's humble, it's polite, it's respectful, non-participation. There's no hatred in the heart of Daniel towards the king. We're gonna see that so clearly in the coming chapters. How do you reach or influence someone you hate? You don't. How do you influence someone that you mock or belittle? You just don't. And we're gonna see this all throughout the book. And so eventually he works out a test. He works out a trial period. Hey, 10 days, we're just gonna eat vegetables. We're just gonna eat water. And in 10 days, let's get back together. And if we're not bigger, stronger, fatter, actually, you're gonna see than these other dudes, then we'll have to talk again. And this is so gutsy. I mean, his boss, the chief of the eunuch said he'd get his head cut off if he didn't offer him the food. What would happen if you refused to eat it, right? This is gutsy. When he said, test us, what he's really saying is, let's put God to the test. 
Because God's going to have to come through or we're going to be in big trouble. And I want you to know this. You see, in this type of culture, in this type of impossible situation, in this type of, of, of circumstances, you will find out very quickly whether you possess something that, is, that very few people possess. Something that is absolutely necessary to be faithful during these times. Without it, you're going to be dead in the water. You want to know what it is? It's something called conviction. Everyone say conviction. Conviction is the heart level decision that in every area of my life, whether it's private or public, whether it's seen or unseen, in every single area of my life, I'm going to obey God and I'm going to trust him with the consequences. I'm going to obey God and I'm going to leave the results in his hands. And there's so few people that have this type of conviction. And so few people have it. You know why? Because it's not formed overnight. It takes years, decades even, of reading God's word and crying out to him and chasing hard after him and obeying in the small things before it comes to the big things. It takes years to develop this. One uh, pastor said, crisis doesn't create conviction. It reveals whether it's there or not. And David has it. His back's against the wall and we just see conviction spilling out. And so this is what he does. So we listen to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and circle fatter in the flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. It worked. They got fat, which is why you shouldn't buy that book on the Daniel diet, right? That's not what diets are supposed to make you do. They're not supposed to make you fat. They're supposed to make you skinny. I'm not saying, I mean, some of you could do with 10 days of vegetables and water, okay? That's... I'm just kidding. I mean, like I would respectfully not participate in that. But the point is, this is not God telling us how to eat. It's a miracle. You shouldn't gain weight on vegetables and water. So God performed a miracle. God came through and the king notices, verse 16. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And as for these four use, God gave them learning and skill and all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding and all visions and dreams. And at the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king, which means they were a part of the inner circle of the most powerful person in the world. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all of his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. And it's this incredible story that really sets us up for all the stuff, all the themes coming in the next few weeks. But it's a good story. It's a crazy story because how does it begin? Well, Babylon takes over the city and that seems like a horrible thing. And they desecrate the temple and that seems like a horrible thing. And they relocate, they kidnap these kids. It seems horrible. And they re-educate them. And Daniel and his friends for three years face constant pressure to deny God and to adopt the gods and the goddesses of the Babylonian. But because they acted with conviction and because they were courageous and they obeyed, what was the result? They were placed in the inner circle and they had not just proximity, but influence to the most evil, but also the most powerful person in the world. And it's almost like God planned it, isn't it? <laughs> it's almost like all of this happened for a reason. And that's the point of this chapter. In fact, there's three words that show up all throughout the book, but they show up three times in this chapter. Did you catch them? Verse two, the Lord gave Jehoiakim. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. The Lord gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. God gave them learning and skill and all literature and all wisdom. What this chapter is saying is that no matter what your circumstances look like, good or bad, scary or peaceful, awesome or horrible, the truth is, is that God, our God, the one true God is always active behind the scenes. He's always moving. He's always working and he can make beauty and life come from ugliness and death. And we on this side of the cross should know that. I mean, what, if, what does the cross teach us if not that God can use the worst thing in the history of the world, the only righteous person to ever live being killed by the people that he came to save. And how did that, how did that end up? 
with life and with salvation offered freely to anyone that would come. That's what this chapter is showing us. He's always moving. He's always working. What we see in the Bible, and especially in this book, is that Daniel is not the main character in the story. Neither are his three friends. Neither is King Nebuchadnezzar or the two other kings that come up. They are not the main characters in a story where God plays a small part. No, 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 it's the opposite. God is the main character and it's Daniel and his friends and the kings that play a small part in that grand story. I see, it's only when we believe that truth deep down in our hearts, it's only when we believe that God is the main character and we are not, that God's got this figured out when we don't, that God's in complete control when everything seems like it's out of control, that he's working everything towards his purposes and his goals, even when we can't see that. It's only when we believe that, that we can live with that type of courage and that type of conviction and that type of obedience that God can use. I mean, what, made, what gave these, these four young men the ability to act with such courage? It wasn't because they were leaders. They're 13 years old. They're not warriors forged in the fire of battle. It's not because of their own strength or their own wisdom or their own willpower. No, no, no. It's because they had a proper view of their God. It's because they had put their faith not in themselves, but in God. And not just any God, in the God of the Bible. And a God that's what? Control over what? What is in control of? Everything. He's in absolute control over the rise and fall of every world power that's ever been and ever will be. He's in control of who runs those things. He's in control of the interpersonal relationships that you and I have. He's in control of the, of the mundane circumstances that we find ourselves in. He's in control of everything and moving everything to the purpose of his will. And we're going to go through that next week. But it's only when you believe that that you can possibly have peace in the face of turmoil, that you can have hope in a hopeless situation, that you can have courage in the face of death and ultimately the conviction to act and obey in a way that God can use, right? The next few weeks are gonna be so important in the life of our church. I want you to be here. I want you to bring friends. If a message like stuck with you, share it online. Just give the YouTube link out. It's gonna be incredibly important. So yes, we're in the midst of a hostile culture, just like Daniel was all those thousands of years ago. But God is sovereign even here. Amen. And nothing has ever been out of his control. Nothing is currently out of his control. Nothing will ever be out of his control. But that doesn't mean that we won't each individually face a crisis like Daniel. That's more likely than ever. And so it's so important that now, while the temperature's rising, but it's still manageable, we cry out to God, God, would you make us people of conviction? Would you pray with me? Father, would you do that in this generation? God, would you so take out of our eyes and our vision the threats and the fear and all of that, and instead, would you fill our vision with your glory and your power and your goodness? Would the history of the millions of times that you've come through for your people use bad things for eternal good things? Would we believe that, Father? So Father, I pray that we would do some hard thinking, have some hard conversations, that we would look at where we need to draw the line in all these different areas. And when we are put to the test, Father, would you use it? Would you give us courage? Would you give us faith to stand up? And would you use that faith, not for our good and our glory, but to show how strong you are and how trustworthy you are? Father, be with us in the coming weeks as we read this amazing book that you've saved for us through. And it's in the beautiful, matchless name of Jesus we pray.